that we have available to us to transmit a spiritual wisdom, essentially. Um, and so they're really fundamental, play a, a special role in neo-humanist education. Um, I find, I'm a collector of stories. I really love stories. I love stories, not just for children, but also as a spiritual teacher, I find that the easiest way and the most memorable way that I've both received and can share spiritual teachings is through storytelling. Um, when I first entered you know, into Anand Marga, and even before then, I was just really attracted to listen to stories, people's real experiences, and also teaching stories. I was um, attracted to the Zen Buddhist tradition, which is just full of stories, now stories of the relationship between the master and the um, student. And uh, those stories contain so many layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. Stories are something magical that you can keep coming back to all throughout your life, and it will never have quite the same meaning for you. No, every time that you hear it, it might resonate with you on a different level. You might discover a new meaning, a new interpretation for that story. So I think we've all experienced, in some way, this touch of stories in our lives. And if you think about it, even our own lives, how we understand ourselves, is a story. We're constantly telling the story of our lives. And depending on our own understanding of what happens to us, how we tell our stories changes. At different points in our life, we can tell the same story about the same experience, but because we have a different understanding, maybe at one point we tell it with a lot of anger and feeling that we're a victim, and later on maybe we tell the same story as a humorous story. <laughs> you know? So it really, we're constantly reinterpreting and understanding our lives through narrative. Um, we're, how, we, uh, how we even think in our, in our minds is a sort of narrative, an ongoing narrative. How we share our experiences with people is a form of narrative. And in education, you know, if you think about um, what you remember when you're in teaching situations and lear as a learner, is often you remember the stories. You know, stories can stay with you years and years and years, while the information just kind of comes in and goes out. Mm. You know? But stories, they have that kind of, they're, they, they come in a, like a whole seed you know, that you receive and it just kind of starts to grow inside of you and give you meaning. <coughs> I remember uh, when I uh, came to the kindergarten and I was looking for how to enrich our library of stories, there was a particular story that I remembered from when I was little and it still was with me. Do you know the story of Frederick the mouse? Mm -hmm. Uh, how he, it's a, it's a lovely story about this, this mouse who um, is, uh, all of the other mice are collecting supplies for the winter, and um, he looks like he's doing nothing, but he's collecting, they, and they challenge him, they're like, what are you doing, why aren't you helping, why aren't you collecting supplies, and he's like, I am, I'm collecting the golden rays of the sun, and the colors of the flowers, because in winter it will be gray and dark, and, <laughs> and he's collecting uh, different you know, colors and sounds and experiences. And then after the, the mice are there in their cave in the night, it, in the winter, and it's cold, and they've finished eating, and they're bored. <laughs> and then they say, and Frederick, what about your supplies? No? And then he tells them to close their eyes, and he paints these colorful pictures in their, in their minds with the words and the thoughts that he collected when they were collecting food. And, and so that story, you know, stayed with me. I think it was, for me, a story that resonated with also, you know, that art is important. You know, not only just getting supplies <laughs> and survival, but also the arts have this importance and feed us on another level. And so that was a story that I, that I remember from being like, I don't know, four, five, six, really little. But I loved the illustrations, they were really well done. And so, you know, I, I was like looking for that story. And when I found that it still existed, because I couldn't remember the author's name or anything, and it, I was hunting in a, in a bookstore in the US for it. And when I found it, it was just such a joy. It was like finding an old friend. <laughs> so, you know, it just shows like how, you know, all of you probably have certain stories that you still remember from your childhood that resonated with you and that stayed with you 
if you dig for them, you'll find them. If they're not right there at the surface, but the, and there's a reason for that, no? So uh, stories really are magical, and we can use this magic in education. And like I said, it's not only about children. This is also uh, even now when I try to um, <coughs> teach certain <coughs> spiritual ideas, I usually start with looking for a story some type of story, because <coughs> I know that that will stay with people so much longer. Like probably you don't remember much what I talked about the other day, but you might still remember the Golden Buddha. Definitely. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so like that, the story contains many different layers of meaning. It's rich, it's something that, that you know you can receive and it continues to work inside of your mind. Whereas information, like I said, it doesn't have that same stickiness mm -hmm. as the stories do. So, you know, <clears throat> and they can really contain powerful messages for our lives. So, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the stories, um, a particular type of story, <coughs> a type of way of creating stories that are specific for classroom needs. I must say this is a bit more geared towards smaller children. But um, Arun's going to come and complete this also with uh, talking about how you can use literature in the classroom, other ways of using story. Um, and I will share a bit with you the idea of utilizing your personal experiences <coughs> as a resource for storytelling. But these were stories specifically, you know, how can you design stories that facilitate an inclusive environment and help all children to feel visible and um, and to channelize behavior problems. I think that you're quite familiar with this, but these concepts were quite new when I was introducing them in Romania, so the difference between inclusion and integration. You now, when you just start integrated, it means, okay, you could all be standing in line to buy a train ticket with a diversity of people, but you're not talking to each other, you don't know each other, you know. So just the fact of being together in the same space doesn't create any, necessarily create any different feelings amongst the people that are in that space together. However, integration is about everybody feeling recognized, included, you know, and understanding each other, respecting each other. So, you know, you have this where people are on the outside, there's exclusion, segregation, you separate them, and integration is just, they're still kind of separate, but within the group, and real inclusion is where everybody has their place. I saw this on the wall. <laughs> Whose bathroom was it? Yours. <laughs> and I looked for it on the internet because I really liked it. Um, yeah, and, it, it, and inclusion and, and creating inclusive environments isn't about it being the same for everybody. No, it's really about adapting so that everybody gets their needs met. Sorry? Or removing the fence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> removing the barriers. Yeah. Nice. What you just did is used a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you took the fence as a metaphor, no? And this is a metaphor also. Yeah, so, you know, so much of what's going on in life is actually only a small part we see on the surface, like the surface of the iceberg. And there's many deeper levels that are actually much more powerful. Um, you might have had talks with Savod. I don't know if he comes here sometimes, no. yeah? No? <coughs> okay, well, anyway, also Manoranjan is familiar with this model of a CLA, <coughs> causal layered analysis. But it's one way of looking at things and, and understanding them on different levels. And only this level is the surface level where it's, you know, what things seem to be about. But you have all these other deeper levels. And what I found really interesting about this model is at the deepest level, you have the narratives, you have the myths, you have the, you know, the that we as a society, collectively and also individually, that are informing how we look at the world. It, it informs our worldview, the stories that we tell to, each, to ourselves. Look at this quote. A people are as healthy and confident as the stories they tell themselves. Sick storytellers can make nations sick. Without stories, we would go mad. Life would lose its moorings or orientation. Stories can conquer fear, you know. They can make the heart larger. And I find they're, you know, they're like a mirror. Stories provide a mirror of 
the world so that we can see ourselves and understand ourselves better. Um, what happens for some children, uh, and again, I think that here I'm speaking with an audience that's much more sensitive and attuned to this <coughs> than when I've done this in Romania, but you know, a lot of what creates exclusion is invisibility. It's not overt discrimination. It's just simply out not, sight, out of mind. yeah, and just not visible. Experience of certain children is not visible. So many materials that are available for uh, children, you know, are ha have implicit assumptions. You know, so many of the books might have, you know, the mother, father, you know, sister, brother kind of constellation of the idea of the family, and then children that don't fit into that paradigm might have difficulty finding themselves validated, finding their experience validated. And so, you know, that's the sensitivity in choosing stories. And I think in English and, and probably in Australia, there's a much greater diversity of stories and diversity of maybe ethnicities visible in stories. But it's still, you know, a great majority of the literature that's been handed down with us until recently was not very aware of that. And so there's still a lot of invisibility of certain types of experiences. And no matter how um, enlightened the society might be, it's still, it's hard to create a story for absolutely everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But you as a teacher, you know exactly what are the experiences going on for each and every child. And so you don't have to limit yourselves only to the stories that are prefabricated, <laughs> what's already available. You can tailor things you know, to the needs in your class. And you can look for specific ways to create that mirror so that all children can find their experiences reflected and can understand themselves and understand their place in the world. The story helps children to understand how to move from certain uh, states of uneasiness towards, you know, show them pathways, show them potential pathways through that. And so they have, you know, enormous potential for healing and for creating inclusion. What we're gonna talk about now is a very simple structure for designing these types of stories, therapeutic stories, which might include also, you might have behavior issues in the class. You might have children that have a really hard time concentrating or staying still. You might have you know, a child that's constantly pinching someone or other types of specific behavior issues that come up. So we're gonna look at just three elements that can be a helpful guide for designing stories. First one is metaphor, and then you have your story journey, and then resolution. And we're gonna go through each of these. <coughs> so metaphor is really the starting point, it's really the seed. This is where you have to do some poetic work, you know, because the root of poetry is just finding a good metaphor, you know, which isn't too, it can't be too literal, otherwise it doesn't have the poetry in it, you know? What makes something poetic is just that it's, it isn't exactly that thing, but it's really similar. You know, so, like for example, if you have the issue of a child that's pinching other children or biting them, what kind of metaphors could you think of? What other animal pinches? Exactly. <laughs> a crab would be a great metaphor. And in fact, I will recommend to you, I should have put it on the slide, but I'll recommend to you an author that has a wealth of therapeutic stories. Her, she's an Australian. I'm planning to go visit her. She's not too far away. Um, Susan Perrow, P-E-R-R-O-W. Perrow, P-E-R-R-O-W, Susan Perrow. She, she wrote. Workshops, doesn't she? she does excellent workshops. Maybe you could invite her here. Excellent her workshops. I don't know. <coughs> I'm only going to I'm not You'll probably meet her. No, well, I'll take her down there. So yeah. I'll probably <laughs> meet her. <laughs> and she does really good. She came to Bucharest and she did a two day workshop. Um, I actually read her book and it just resonated with me so <coughs> deeply and I found it so useful. I immediately went and wrote a story for an issue that I was dealing with with my children. And I looked for her on the web. I just wanted to like thank her for her stories. And I found her address and I wrote to her and I sent her the story that I wrote. And I was so surprised when she wrote me back and she said, can I include your story in my next book? And I'm like, wow, <laughs> 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 and, uh, and then I started some dialogue with her and I found out she would be coming to Europe and I invited her to Bucharest to give a workshop and it was amazing. 
And then, uh, and what I'm teaching you now is just a small uh, seed of that. Now, if you get a chance to do a full workshop with her, you'll really come out of there with several stories that you've written and a very clear idea about how to go about it. But I hope I can give you at least the starting point for that. So, um, yeah, I found it always kind of like when I was thinking, oh, I need to come up with a story for the kids, I didn't know where to start. You know, it, was feel it felt like a big challenge. It's like I always get kind of paralyzed in front of a blank canvas. I have this type of artist block, you know, <laughs> like, oh, where to start? <laughs> I know I want to do something, but I don't know what. But when you start from the point of view of looking at a problem, a real situation that really you see happening with children, it's very easy then, because what you do is what we just did. You think of the situation, okay, I've got kids fighting or pinching, and what kind of animal, what kind of, you know, what kind of other entity could I use to represent that? And you came up immediately with a crab. And one of Susan Perra's stories is about a crab. And it's exactly, it was exactly for that issue. It's a beautiful story. The crab is playing, um, I'll just give you a very, very short, uh, the essence of it. The, the crab, um, all of the uh, friends on the beach are kind of upset because crab is always pinching them. And you know, the stork is missing feathers and the, the fish is also <laughs> uncomfortable, like the starfish. And, they're all, and they all get together and they consult with each other. You know, well, I'm tired of getting pinched by crab. And some of them are talking about, oh, we should, you know, we should uh, throw him back in the sea or something. Uh, some want to exclude him. And then uh, the, I forget which animal it is, but one of them represents uh, wisdom. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I, I have an idea. I have a better idea. And so they go and they gather seaweed and they, they weave some gloves for a crab to put over his pinchers, you know, to help him to keep his pinchers nice and warm and cozy mm -hmm. so that he will. <laughs> And then, um, and then when he has these gloves on, it helps him to remember, you know, because he, he can't use his pinchers, they're nice and warm and cozy, to be able to play with the other sea creatures and get along. And he actually feels so much better because now everybody's happy to have him around. And, uh, and there's a resolution of the story. Um, and actually, in, the, in, the, in reality, the teacher had also created some mittens, no? That then uh, the child who was having this, this problem uh, tried on. No, and, and so it helped to extend the story into the classroom uh, and helped, you know, help that child to have a way to think about his, his pinching and to understand himself and the, and the situation from another point of view. So, um, yeah, the, the starting point is finding a nice metaphor. The metaphor shouldn't be so literal or so obvious mm -hmm. that a child is going to feel that you're pointing a mm -hmm. finger at them. You know, because that's going to close them down, make them embarrassed. The other children might start saying, oh, <laughs> that's just like so-and-so. So it has to be subtle enough. Now, this is the alchemy of storytelling, is that it really can't be exactly the situation. It has to resonate with the situation. It has to create a certain poetic resonance that will, you know, allow, because it's much easier for children to, I don't know if you've noticed this, it's much easier for them to empathize with a doll like if you use the persona doll stories, it's much easier for them to empathize with the situation that a doll is going through or, or a character in a story is going through than it is if you directly ask them to empathize with each other. You know, like think about how you're hurting the other children when you pinch them. It just doesn't go through the same way. No, but if you give them the mirror, it's a lot easier to, to you know, see the situation in a mirror than it is to try and see it directly. It's like we actually can't see ourselves without having a mirror. So uh, this, is, this is what we're looking for. In the first place, we're looking for a metaphor, and that will give us the seed. And there's two types of, there's two <coughs> major categories of metaphors that you use in this type of storytelling, which is one, a metaphor that represents the problem, um, like here the crab, and then you have your helping metaphors. No? So this is often in the form of some type of element which will represent wisdom. It can, you know, it's often another creature, it can be a fairy, it can be something magical, um, and also like the gloves were a helping metaphor in that story that I described to you briefly. So you're looking for your problem metaphors and for your helping metaphors. Mm -hmm. And to come up with metaphors, when you do a workshop with Susan Perro, she kind of like designs this, on the whiteboard, a bag, and she's like, let's fill up the bag with potential, you know, metaphors. So you could have like stick, sun, you know, stone, shell, jewel, uh, 
uh, you know, just fill it up with just different beautiful ideas from nature, from you know, fairy tales, from magic. And uh, when you're looking for metaphors, then you can go and kind of look at your bag of <laughs> seeds and see which one you know is resonating. But it's you know just kind of keeping yourself having a lot of different things available to you. <coughs> All right, and I'll give you another example. Like, uh, sometimes stories can be too literal, and then they don't, and then they really are moralizing, and they and they sit very differently with children, I think. Um, for example, uh, one of my teachers was creating a story, she told me a story that she made, or I think I listened to it in the classroom, but it was a story about, yeah, the children, there's a child who um, doesn't want to wash her hands and she's getting dirty, <laughs> and then, you know, because she didn't wash her hands, uh, she got sick, and her stomach was hurting, and then, you know, the next day she realized that she should wash her hands, and then she washed her hands and so, okay, what's missing there? <laughs> what did you say, poetry, what else did you say? <coughs> Metaphor, yeah, it was just very literal. It was exactly the situation that she saw in the classroom that she was unhappy with, and she just just made a story about it. But it's really from, from whose point of view was that story written? An adult point of view, right? Do children, when they not wash their hands, think that they're gonna get sick? Do they make that connection? Do they have that ability to be thinking in that way? Would they suddenly just realize that on their own? So there was also missing some type of helping metaphor, you know? Oftentimes, and that was sometimes, somebody was saying that they found the circle of love stories too sweet, too sugary, it was you. Yeah, and, uh, because they didn't have actually like some type of process in having conflict. It's like the kids are just good, you know? They're just like, oh, and then they realize that they should be nice to each other. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that it's not it, it's not enchanting it doesn't it doesn't really what is it flavor yeah it doesn't have a flavor to it you know you 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 know so i i thought about that and i haven't really written it as a story yet but i just have a metaphor that so i thought and i would challenge you to, to make this into a story and to incorporate so especially for the little ones you could incorporate a nice song into this or a poem about watching hands. so i thought okay you could have the soap is just, you know, the soap's favorite thing to do is to make bubbles. Do you like making bubbles? <laughs> and you're a little kid who loves making bubbles. You know? So uh, the soap loves to make bubbles and is just waiting to go and meet her friend Water. Because only when she meets Water and when a little child rubs their hands together, then like magic, it makes bubbles. And the soap is so happy. <laughs> And so what you can have is that, you know, the children come into the bathroom and the soap is really looking forward to the, to the children, you know, that are going to go and rub her together with water so she can make the bubbles. And then they don't stop to, they won't get to. <laughs> and this can happen a few times, you know, because repetition is good. It helps to build up the tension in the story. And so, you know, the soap is getting more and more disappointed and sad. And then eventually, you know, you have a child that remembers because the child's teacher maybe was singing a song about washing the hands. And so the child comes in singing the song about bubbles and washing the hands. And the soap gets so excited. And then the soap gets to meet the water and they rub together and they make bubbles and ecstasy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same issue, but you see now, it's from a child's point of view. It has a <coughs> metaphor in there that would capture a child's imagination so that when they go to the bathroom, they're looking forward to touching the soap in the water because they're thinking about the bubbles. And they're probably even going, look, are there really bubbles there? You know? And so, you know, it would like create an, a fascination with the whole process of washing the hands. So that's how you could use a simple metaphor to attract children towards doing an activity that maybe they're avoiding to do but you're stepping down on their level. So one of the keys to coming up with a good metaphor is empathy. You have to, and this is why I think uh, therapeutic story writing is therapeutic not just for the child, but also for the teacher, because you have to change your frame of reference, you have to step down on their level, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to come up with a metaphor that uh, will resonate with them. Yeah, so.
reframing, you know, is part of the first steps to uh, coming up with something that's therapeutic. You know, and this is the same as if you're approaching challenging behavior in a classroom and you're just reacting to it or labeling it, you don't get very far. But if you try to think, to step down, to kind of empathize and think, where is this child coming from? What's driving this behavior? What's behind it? What's the cause? Like, it helps you to change your frame of reference and it helps you to awaken more empathy. And that's necessary for coming up with a good metaphor. The next important step is the journey. So the journey has different stages, no? But the most important thing to understand about journey is that only problems are interesting. There has to be some conflict. There has to be some tension. There has to be a state of imbalance. You can't start out with already having balance. You have to go from imbalance to balance, and there has to be some type of really interesting conflict. And that's why Madhavi was saying, yeah, okay, we were having a discussion in the EC group about fairy tales, appropriateness, inappropriateness, <laughs> whether they're okay. And you know, she was saying, yes, but at least they have really good black and white and tension and you know, conflict between good and evil, and, and there's some type of magic in there as well. And if you try to just sugarcoat it, it usually, you, you dilute it, you lose, it, you lose something. It's about life. <coughs> life is still very much a struggle. You know it has to be in a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so conflict and using obstacle metaphors, increasing the tension with small children, this can be just simple, like, do you know stories like uh, the big radish, the great radish, mm -hmm. where it's like, yeah. you know, okay, so it's just like, in that story, uh, more and more characters keep coming to help to pull the radish out of the ground. It's a very simple story. The, the tension is simply the, you know, that each time another character comes. And so that repetition, um, repeating different rhymes throughout a story, uh, that gives it... Um, There's a story like that called A Dark, Dark Tale. Mm.
what she didn't like? Because she was so excited to visit a new place. She had never seen a pond before. Her sister waited for her and helped her when she fell. When they reached the pond, there were many, many spiders gathered in the trees and bushes near the water. Everybody was talking excitedly about the best places to spin webs. When all of the spiders began weaving their webs to catch mos buzzing mosquitoes, Ziggy also began weaving her web. She fastened an anchor to the branch she was sitting on and jumped, and jumped and sailed into the air until she caught another branch. She fastened another anchor and she jumped again. She carefully made a triangle frame and then she started to make a wheel in the middle. Soon she would start weaving the sticky spiral center of the web. The other spiders had already finished and were relaxing comfortably on their webs as they waited for mosquitoes to land in their sticky silk and get stuck. One of them had already begun to eat his dinner. But Siggy was still weaving her web. Her web took much longer to make with only six legs, but she was an expert by now and she knew she could do it. She wasn't worried. A spider in a tree next to her called out, Hey, Slowpoke, what's wrong with you? Why are you taking so long to, to uh, weave, make a web? There won't be any mosquitoes left by the time you're done. Ziggy felt her face get warm and red, but she didn't listen to the mean spider and kept weaving. Her sister got angry and said, leave her alone. She's my sister and she makes beautiful webs. It just takes her longer. There was another spider sitting on a raspberry bush below her who whispered, shh, don't you see she only has six legs? Oh, poor thing. Some of the other spiders started to make puffing noises and shake their heads sadly. This also didn't make Ziggy feel very happy. She had six legs, but she'd been making webs her whole life just like everybody else. In fact, back home, her mother always said that her webs were the most beautiful in the whole family because she took so much time and patience to make them. Her mother told her, it's the amount of work you put into a web that makes it beautiful, and nobody worked harder than Ziggy on her webs. The mean spider laughed and said, what, only six legs? Never heard of a spider with six legs. All spiders have eight legs, everybody knows that. Some of his friends also started to laugh. She didn't know which was worse, listening to the laughter or listening to the whispers and sighs of pity. Zaza called out to her, hey Ziggy, don't listen to them, show them what you can do. Darkness settled like a cloak over the forest and Ziggy hid, her, uh, hid, uh, and hid Ziggy in her half fini finished web from the other spiders. All of a sudden, Ziggy felt like crying. She didn't feel like making her web. She wasn't hungry anymore. Even the buzzing of hundreds of mosquitoes seemed to taunt her as if to say, you can't catch us, you can't make a web. Spider tears rolled down her cheeks and got stuck to the web, just like little glass beads. The moon was rising and still her web was only half done. All of a sudden, her whole web shook as the branch it was anchored to bounced up and down in the air as two large taloned feet landed softly. A gray owl had settled on the branch and his large yellow eyes turned to gaze steadily at little Ziggy. Why, with what lovely tools you have decorated your web, I've never seen anything quite so extraordinary. But it's getting late and you haven't finished. Aren't you hungry? Ziggy said, they're not jewels, they're just tears, and I'm not hungry because I'm sad. Ooh, ooh, said the owl. Why would such a lovely little spider be so sad? The spiders here all think I can't make a, a web because I only have six legs. The owl peered more closely at her. Ah, indeed, indeed, you have six legs, but your lovely jeweled web is already half finished. So I can see you know something about weaving. Ziggy felt a little better. Yes, my mother says my webs are the best in the family because I worked so long on each one. The owl said, hmm, let's see them. Ziggy worked and worked while the owl patiently watched, sometimes letting out a long, ooh, ooh. 
which made Ziggy feel brighter inside. Once she stumbled and the silks got all mixed up in her six long legs, but the owl watched patiently and simply said, you're almost done, just a little more. I can't wait to see it finished. When the moon reached above the treetops, the moonbeams reflected on a lovely spiral web decorated with a few special shining bees. The mysterious owl, who had never introduced himself, smiled with appreciation, and Ziggy felt herself glow with satisfaction. The branch bounced again, and the web also bounced up and down, shimmering in the moonlight, as the owl jumped from the branch, spreading its great wings as it flew into the night sky towards the sky. Of had learned from Didi and Andamitra about including that in stories so that often there can be that like oh moon I don't know what to do like that yeah. that I mean as a particular element because you didn't list it but I mean often it comes in that you there's a metaphoric character for exactly. for your inner That's self you yeah so I just it's there but I just wanted to mention it yeah yeah it can be kind it. of representing even that spiritual force mm -hmm. which in a lot yeah. of my stories I have um, it might be a moonbeam it might be uh, an owl, it might be a spider on the wall, but you know, there's a helping metaphor that is the voice of wisdom, that is the voice, you know, it could be a fairy, but that represents that sort of spiritual, magical touch, you know, and that helps to create the transformation in the story mm -hmm. and helps to provide that, you know, and this story was designed to also be a healing story for teachers, you know, for the teachers, especially like I said in Romania, where there's a lot of resistance to working with children with special needs. And so, and I wanted to use the metaphor, also thinking that it gave a model for the teachers through the owl of a nice way to be and to interact with children, you know. So sometimes, uh, Susan's also written stories for, um, you know, a parent who's maybe, ha the, the child's having separation issues, the child's having separation issues. <laughs> <laughs> you all know that the, the story is gonna also have to be for the mothers now, you know? <laughs> So she wrote a lovely story about a koala bear, and the, the, the little koala, while the mother's sleeping, wanders off onto a higher branch to get some leaves, you know? And, uh, and actually, basically, the koala bear's okay, even though it's wandered up high. But it's the mother koala bear also dealing with her anxiety about, ah, oh, the child is up so high. So, you know, so it's interesting, you know, because she said that, like, you know, the stories often are for everybody listening in different ways. Um, yeah, so that's just one example. I want to uh, also give you um, an idea about, I had a few other stories, but I don't think we have time to do all of them. Um, one that I will just describe to you briefly, because I think it's something that a lot of people face. This is a Susan Harrow story, and I won't read the whole story because I didn't remember reading the book with me. But um, the essence of this story, it's a story actually for a child with ADHD. It was for a child that wasn't able to stay still in the classroom, and I think many of you might struggle with similar uh, <laughs> issues. No, they don't have that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have so much space. They don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? so um, the metaphor was a wild pony, you know, that just loved to run and gallop through the fields and, and uh, always running and running. But whenever she came in the barn at night, she couldn't keep her little... Um, she couldn't keep her legs still, and she would be uh, kicking. The farmer never could come near her because she'd be kicking and, and moving, and, and she made a lot of noise. And because the, um, as it was summer, she gets more and more dusty and uncomfortable and hot, and the flies are coming and biting her, and she it gets more and more uncomfortable, and, uh, and yet the farmer can't help her because you know all night she's keeping everybody else awake. She's <coughs> rolling around, she's, you know, she's, if the farmer tries to get near to her, like I said, it's getting kicked. So what happens? Your helping metaphor here is the brush. <laughs> a magical speaking brush. Who lets her know that he loves nothing better than to brush the ponies 
and that when he brushes the pony, it's gonna feel so nice because all that dust is gonna go out of his fur and he'll feel good again. And he tells him, but you know, the farmer would love to brush you, but you'll have to stay still. You'll have to tell your little um, <coughs> legs to stay still so that he can brush you. And so with the encouragement of the, of the brush, <laughs> <laughs> With the person of the brush, the, the pony is like there, he's like telling to his legs, please, please, stay still, legs, stay still, legs. And the farmer is able to get close enough to brush him, and he feels so nice, and that night he's able to sleep really peacefully, and the brush is super happy, you know, because the brush likes nothing better than to be able to brush him. You know, and so this, this story was done, and then the child, actually, again, it's really magical. For one thing, if you make a story, you can get good ideas from stories that already exist. But if you make the story for a child, or even if you take a frame like this and you slightly adapt it so that it's you know really mm -hmm. for that child in the classroom, sure. it's magical because that child can feel your love. I mean, it's a real expression of love mm -hmm. to make a story for somebody. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the child who was the red pony <laughs> of, the, of the classroom, he you know she gave a chance. Who would like to be in the center and pretend they're the pony so we can all brush you? And he immediately volunteered. You know. And that getting a sort of massage and like by getting uh, brushed by all the other children was very settling for him. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they would play this game where he played mm -hmm. the pony getting brushed. Mm -hmm. And I think also that the, the demonstration of how you talk to yourself to get yourself to control your behavior mm -hmm. was also really nice. So in the story that's modeled through mm -hmm. how the pony is trying mm -hmm. to get himself to mm -hmm. stay still. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like giving a metaphor of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean, these are just a few ideas um, which you can develop and make your own stories. Um, just take a moment now, I'd like to give you just a few moments to write down a particular situation that you're struggling with in the classroom and see if you can think of, you don't have to come up with a story, but just see if you can come up with a metaphor. Just give you a few minutes. Okay. Back stuff. I thought you said which one, I'm like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.